France's new socialist president, François Mitterrand, reviews this year's Bastille Day parade in Paris. Mitterrand wanted this celebration to have less pomp and ceremony than in the past. He wanted it to be an occasion made by and for the people themselves. For this year, things have changed in France. President Mitterrand's power has been buttressed by the legislative elections he called after taking office. These elections have given the socialists a solid majority in the National Assembly. With the left already controlling most municipalities and the major labor unions, France is now embarking on a bold socialist experiment, unique for a major West European democracy since World War II. The outcome of that experiment may well affect the hopes of the left everywhere, throughout Europe and beyond. The opening day of the new parliament saw the socialists clarify the sweeping range of their program. Many people had thought a large socialist majority would mean a centrist social democrat regime. They were wrong. The French socialist tradition has again proved basically radical, libertarian. The socialist aim is to change at least some of the patterns of power in France. Their plans have received close attention because in the National Assembly, the socialists can do what they like. The center-right opposition has been crushed. Rightist leaders have, in vain, warned of grave consequences ahead. Gaullist Jacques Chirac has emerged as the major figure in the weakened opposition. Some say he's even secretly content at former President Giscard d'Estaing's downfall. For if the socialists falter, and Chirac sure they will, then he and his party could be well placed at the next elections. Though Chirac will try to benefit from any socialist unpopularity, there seems little he can do to stop the government enacting its program. On the left, the communists have also lost out. They've seen their presence in the National Assembly cut by almost half. Even so, Mitterrand and his premier, Pierre Morois, included four communist ministers in their first post-election cabinet. That way, the socialists have paid their debts. For communist voters helped elect socialist deputies in the second round of the elections. And communist organizations still play a major role in French society. This is a demonstration by the major French labor confederation, the CGT. The communists control it. The socialists prefer communists with them in the cabinet rather than outside the government where they'd be more likely to cause economic unrest. And the socialists want the energy of communist militants behind them in countless factories, universities and city offices. Even so, the socialists drove a hard bargain in allowing communists into the cabinet. At this meeting, which outlined the terms of the alliance, the communists agreed to accept the socialist view of the world on Afghanistan, on the NATO alliance, and on opposition to the Soviet missile buildup in Europe. Under these conditions, then, with the communists as allies and the conservatives severely weakened, the socialists have announced they'll fulfill their program. Premier Morois' cabinet has gotten together all the trends in the socialist party. It's a cabinet with six women, including a self-educated former typist and the country's first woman agriculture minister. It's also a cabinet that includes tokens of reassurance in the shape of former Gaullist politicians and industrialists. The socialists were far from united in what they wanted to accomplish. But Mitterrand and Morois have managed to balance the many different aspirations within the Socialist Party, itself a major achievement. The major trends in socialist thinking have emerged in repeated congresses since the early 70s. 
Many influential socialists see a new vision for France, a socialism that's decentralized, without, they say, the authoritarian central power of the Soviet-based system. They only half-heartedly accept the alliance with the communists, or even the principle of nationalization. They are sure their ideas are democratic. They say they want to give responsibility back to each citizen. They talk enthusiastically of workers managing their plants and businesses. A much more radical idea than the limited worker participation the Gaullists proposed in the early 70s. While projects for a new society may await them in the long term, many French working people have seen the first impact of the new government on their payslips. For the socialists have already raised the minimum wage by 10 percent. Despite the reservations of some government members, they're also sticking to their promise to nationalize major remaining private banks and industrial groups. But then that's not so new for France anyway. The major banks are already nationalized, as well as large corporations like Renault Cars and Elf Oil. The main thrust of the government's economic policy will be to expand the economy, to stimulate supply and demand, or, as some observers put it, to spend its way out of recession. A recession that's hit France like most countries, with prices rising and production falling. While the governments of the U.S. and Britain try to deflate the economy to overcome this crisis, the French socialist solution is just the reverse. The government will pump money into industry. They hope that will relieve unemployment. Madame Lollier is out of work, and there are nearly two million people like her in France today. Apart from expanding industry, the government will also create 200,000 jobs in the public sector. It'll pour more money into research to develop new technologies, especially in the computer industry. <laughs> These, then, are the ways the new government is tackling the current recession. But its other plans are more ambitious. As the party theoreticians would wish, it envisions a different type of society. The socialists believe they should take account of the increasing automation of French industry. They see a society where workers will have more free time. So as soon as Mitterrand took over, he called for more intense negotiations between labor and management for agreement on a 35-hour week. The two sides have already agreed on a 39-hour work week for next year to help relieve unemployment. They'll continue negotiating for further reductions. Many people throughout France fear that all these plans, increased wages and allowances, more spending, fewer working hours, will simply cost too much money. They fear France can't afford them. To help pay the bill, the government's already placed an extra income tax on the wealthiest taxpayers. Many middle-class families are sure that's just the beginning of a campaign to squeeze the rich. And conservative economists, as well as many French employers, feel the socialist remedies are a recipe for disaster. But in accord with their ambitions for a more libertarian society, the socialist plans extend well outside the economy, into the social fabric of France. With the greater leisure opportunities they see in the future, they've even created a minister for free time. They sponsored this pop concert in Paris's Bastille Square, something the previous regime would never have considered. This indeed is a different face of France. There have already been important social reforms in the justice system. Terrorists, like the Corsican autonomists who planted this bomb, have long been tried at the Special Court for State Security. De Gaulle set up the court to try political cases, not only terrorism, but also treason and espionage. Many critics cast strong doubts on its impartiality. Now the socialists have acted quickly to abolish it. And they want to abolish the death penalty. Outlawing the guillotine would be a major step, 
and not necessarily popular in a country where the law and order lobby has wide support. The government also plans to lessen the overcrowding of French prisons with an amnesty for 5,000 inmates. Many conservative French women and men fear these social measures will only mean a more dangerous, crime-ridden world for their children to grow up in. Some say the socialist state will encroach into all areas, including education. The government has promised to stop state aid to private and religious schools, and many see that as threatening their dearly held freedom of choice. The socialists claim their planned reform of broadcasting will mean less government influence, not more. Critics of French state television say it's often been ponderous, politically partial, or just plain boring. The socialists plan to free TV from government political influence, allowing it to express differing viewpoints. Many top executives have already resigned under pressure, while the opposition has alleged a witch hunt atmosphere at TV headquarters. Already, critics can see changes in television news. Newscasts still give attention to the president, but they also provide more space for criticism of the government, in this case by communists. This kind of impartial approach is something many viewers say has been lacking for far too long. Marseille, un quatrième membre du SAC inculpé et écroué dans l'affaire de la tuerie d'Oriol qui a coûté la vie, je vous le rappelle, à l'inspecteur de police Jacques Massy, qui était lui aussi membre du SAC, et à toute sa famille, en tout six personnes. Personalities who've rarely been seen on television before are now visible. This is Jean-Edern Allier, a former radical opponent of the Gaullists. It's his first time as a guest on a newscast like this. Polémiste, très polémiste, pourrait-on dire, journaliste, éditeur. À l'évidence, il partage la France en deux. Il est adulé ou franchement détesté, mais en aucun cas, il ne laisse indifférent. French radio also will change. The government station has long had, in principle, a broadcast monopoly. In fact, it shares the airwaves with just three other stations broadcasting from outside the country. The socialists will end the monopoly and introduce new local stations, more responsive to their communities. But if the government program appears sweeping in domestic, economic and social policy, the engineers of its foreign standpoint say France must still live with the world. Changes here will be on the margins of present policy. The core of France's world approach will stay the same. There have been initial disagreements with the U.S. The Americans resented communist ministers in the cabinet. The French said high U.S. interest rates weakened the French. economic and foreign policy objectives of President Reagan. We talked a lot about the economic situation. But Mitterrand has reassured the Americans. He supports the Atlantic Alliance and has condemned the Soviet missile buildup in Europe. Vice President Bush, visiting Mitterrand, seemed happy with the relationship. Another visit as well. Yet one area where things will change is in Africa. The socialists accuse the previous center-right regimes of intervening here, as if France were still a colonial power. These were French troops in Chad 11 years ago. France, say the socialists, will no longer be the gendarme of Africa but will instead emphasize the need for a new economic order in relations with developing countries. Other foreign policy areas still remain uncertain. But France's role in the European community may change little, especially if President Mitterrand succeeds in emulating Giscard d'Estaing's warm special relationship with West German Chancellor Schmidt. The new government will also want to continue France's traditionally friendly relations with the Arab world. Here, Iraqi official Tarek Aziz visits Mitterrand. He, like other Arabs, had feared that Mitterrand's sympathy with Israel could prejudice political and trade relations with the Arabs. But the French government has condemned the Israeli raid on Iraq's nuclear reactor. And it'll honor the former regime's arms supply contracts.
Overseas governments generally have been reassured to learn that France will probably continue its role as the world's third biggest arms dealer. All contracts will be honored, even with rightist regimes like Chile and Argentina, and even when the Americans oppose those deals, as is the case with Libya. But then the socialists know that broken contracts could spell disaster for French arms manufacturers and more unemployment in French industry. The contrast between domestic change and foreign policy continuity is clearest in the nuclear field, for anti-nuclear demonstrations like this have had their effect. The socialists have imposed a moratorium on new nuclear plant construction, thus reversing the country's all-out commitment to the nuclear option. And yet French atomic weapons tests will continue. No amount of demonstrating is likely to change the socialist stated commitment to preserving their country's military stance. There seems little doubt, then, that the socialist government's major domestic changes will emerge within a republican framework, rather than a revolutionary one. A framework which guarantees France's role in the world as the solid base on which the domestic change can evolve. But there's one area where the socialist theoreticians will produce a profound transformation, almost a revolution in the very structure of French administration. This is Lyon, France's second city. For centuries here, the government's representative in the region, the prefect, has taken major decisions affecting local communities. And all decisions, however small, have to be referred back to the government in Paris before they can be acted upon. The prefect in this historic building is appointed directly by the government, as are the 104 other prefects in France. In this way, the central administration has long had near total power over the provinces. Now all that will change. In what Premier Morois calls the major business of Mitterrand's seven-year term, regional and departmental councils will take over the prefect's role. They'll have substantive autonomy. It won't be a federal system. But it will mean an historic change in French centralized bureaucracy. Constitutional change will also extend to the National Assembly, where the socialists will call for an electoral system of proportional representation and a shorter, non-renewable term for the president. Today, many of France's older citizens remember its last socialist government, the hopes raised by the Popular Front 45 years ago. And they remember also the disappointments. Now, for young people, the socialists have promised a vision of France where every person feels useful, where people would whistle contentedly on their way to work. Have they promised too much? Are theirs visions of utopia doomed to disappoint leftist students like these? Or does the far-reaching socialist program offer realistic solutions to France's problems? If the government can't satisfy the hopes it has raised, it may well be in for a difficult time ahead.